Okay, thanks, Lucy. Uh, thanks, everyone, uh, for joining. Uh, this is definitely a topic near and dear to any uh, PCB manufacturer. Um, so today is primarily around uh, PCB manufacturing, but there's also DFA around assembly. But so, but if you have questions, please around either just definitely ask, and we can try and address those as well. So key key question. This is like the, our topics today, right? So you know, what's the purpose of DFM? Um, you know, what what does it assist with? How does it help you? And, you know, what are some major guidelines that you shouldn't really break, some rules that you shouldn't break? So that's what today's all about. So key, key point, right? Um, DFM is a good practice uh, that really helps all around, right? So it helps um, get your prototypes out faster. It helps get your production run set up properly. Um, so you don't have issues when your board finally makes it to production. Uh, and it also keeps your overall cost down for your project, for your company. Um, so DFM has, you know, wide implications around cost, reliability, uh, and um, is so basically it's super, super important. I think that's the takeaway um, from this. So what does DFM mean in terms of the PCB? Well, there's lots and lots of checks, so we won't be covering every single one. And it is very design dependent, but these are some of the common ones. And these are some of the, the ones that every designer should know about, um, whether they have, they go through their own software check or not. So, you know, one of the key things is, um, you know, make setting up your etching for success. And, uh, you know, that really completely has to do with your layout. So avoiding sharp angles, um, avoiding slivers, and uh, Altium has a great DFM tool to check for all of that uh, as well in real time. And then yes. next most, sorry, go ahead. Cadence. Oh, sorry, cadence, my bad. Uh, okay, so the next big topic is uh, annular ring. So annular rings are, you know, the most, commonly asked question and depending on your stack up and your class that's when annular ring uh, guidelines uh, come into play and uh, next would be things like uh, board warpage so if you don't think about board warpage uh, you'll think about it when it happens to you uh, because it really messes up installation assembly you know all those type of things um, understanding the thermal management uh, from a layout perspective and then solder mask design uh, to avoid any kind of assembly issues, solder bridging, etc. And then uh, silk screen as well. So these are the type topics we'll be talking about. So here's a structured way to think about uh, DFM. Uh, when you're you know working on your design, start with your stack up and make sure your stack up is designed properly. And this is even before you start any layout. Um, once you have your stack up and your component placements, you know, you start your, your routing. And even if all your routing rules aren't set up properly, you should still be aware of what's critical and what's not. So when you leave this webinar today, you should have that uh, in, your, in your tool chest. When you set up your your drills understand that you're setting yourself up for success. You're setting yourself up for the right class of product, uh, be it medical or aerospace or military um, or even standard. And that, uh, you know, your, your fabricator agrees to your, to your drills. I think that's really key. And then lastly, solder mask, silk screen, and then getting your design files right. 
That's the, if, I may, I may, if I can jump in here real quick, um, um, being a, a designer in my past life, um, one of the rules that I had for my design team was that they couldn't uh, add any traces to a design if they had not spoken to our board house or the board house that we were going to use for that project meaning get a stack up, uh, understand the impedances and the trace widths required, understand the drilling aspects. Um, you know, if, if one of my designers uh, didn't talk to the board shop before starting a design, uh, they were in line to get fired, uh, basically, um, because we wanted our designs to go through that CAM department uh, as easily as possible without any issues. Because as we know, uh, anytime there's an issue uh, with the CAM data or the data going through the CAM department, that means delays and delays uh, cost money. So always talk to your board shop. Absolutely. And actually, I'm going to chime in on that too, on the solder mask and silk screen stuff on the assembly side of the world too. Being inside of the contract manufacturing world for most of my career until I came over to Cadence, the amount of bad solder mask that you end up having and the amount of boards that we rejected um, because the designers didn't actually pay attention to what was going on with the solder mask becomes very, very evident. I would highly recommend you guys pay super close attention to it. What you don't know is, is in the contract manufacturing world, when you're doing the assembly on this, those guys are wizards. They just do amazing things to make stuff work. But that also talks case takes money and time. You may not pay for it on that board, but on the next board, we always kept track of it. We always kept track of it. Oh, yeah, these guys, man, they don't know what they're doing. And we know we got to add a factor. I call it the fudge factor. And we would add a fudge factor of 10% or 15% to the designs because we knew that they would come in, the solder mask would be bad, or the paste mask would be all hokey and pokey and everything else. And the silk would be all over the place and it would cost us more time. If you pay attention to your solder masks and how things are being done and really talk to your assembly shop and where they want it, do you want it um, solder mask defined pads? How do you actually do that? What kind of clearances? What kind of tolerances? What type of process you're doing for it? It makes a very large difference. Um, and the other thing with the stack ups, um, we'll get in a little bit more into that. The 2581 process saves a lot of time. We'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. But with uh, the warpage and everything else, as uh, Amit was talking about, is it really becomes down to is having symmetrical. But wait a minute, I'm doing RF. How do I have symmetrical? This is actually where you really need to work with your fab shops and be very conscientious about how much copper you're removing from every single layer. Even if you have a symmetrical stack, if you have an RF area and you're having reference planes down to layer three or layer four from the top, so N minus three, you end up having the amount of copper removed onto it and you end up getting slight warpage that can happen over a period of time because the thermal expansions change. Just little things like that you got to pay attention to. And you get, then you get the classic thing of, I got RF, I can't have signals in there because the RF engineer doesn't want it, but the fab shop needs it for a balancing so they don't have warpage. Yeah, well, welcome to the world of, wonderful world of design. There's never a right way of doing it. That's a great point. Uh -huh. Yeah, very nice points. Thanks. And please chime in more uh, so we yep. can have a discussion around around these slides um, and, around, and, and just get the best knowledge to the participants today. So, yeah. Okay. So, and then, so, you know, again, this is just a, a high level what we're going to be going through today, right? So, we're going to start with the design files to submit because I don't think it's people get that right still. Um, and um, then we'll talk about stack ups. Uh, and, uh, you know, what we, again, we can't talk about everything, but this is what we think is important uh, today. Okay, so design file formats, you know, what should you include? What shouldn't you include? Uh, you know, Sierra is a, a NIST certified facility. Uh, so, you know, if you are sending your data to a company that understands uh, how to manage the data and has been audited and certified to that, then you have less uh, concerns about sending over an ODB data, which is rich with uh, netlist information or 2581. Uh, but if you're sending uh, your files to someone who doesn't have those credentials, then I my personal advice is definitely do not send rich information. It just makes it, you know, you're, you're prone to, um, um, you know, uh, 
what's the right for a way to say it, but basically your data is now kind of out in the open. So, uh, you know, think about that uh, before you send over ODB in 2581, but all in all, I would lean towards 2581 and ODB. If I can make a comment on that real yeah. quick here, with the sure. 2581, um, uh, we believe, as a designer, I believe that 2581 is actually the way of going. And mm -hmm. the reason is, is earlier on, uh, uh, Amit had a slide up there where you had your thermal ties and they were rotated. And what ends up happening is ODB++, you end up having these conversion files and having your flash files, and it doesn't actually read what's coming through. Um, where IPC 2581 actually reads what your data is, is coming out. We had a very large company um, convert over from uh, ODB++ as their standard to IPC 2581. One of the big guys in the Silicon Valley, everybody hears of them, I can't talk about them, but they're here. Um, and when they did that, one of their process was is to actually start comparing ODB++ to the 2581 to the Gerber and kind of stack all three of them up and go a comparison. What they found is, is ODB++ takes a lot of, OD, we do a lot of changes inside of our design to make it work with ODB++. 2581 basically gives you an unfiltered and perfectly good output. From the beginning, you don't have to alter things. You don't have to make these flash files. You don't have to do all the rest of this. It reads the data properly. And also the way that the standard is uh, evolving is it's becoming more and more powerful as time goes on. Um, not to say that it's open standard. How many of you guys have get off an ODB++ and you get a corruption? When you're trying to read it into someplace, you get a corruption. When you're trying to kick it out, you have problems. I had multiple problems all over the place on that. So I really enjoy the 2581 is the way of the future. And what's happening right now is the largest companies are actually switching over to it. Um, and Sierra is right on board with it. And it actually shows you who, what kind of quality of your shop that you're dealing with. When you get a shop that goes, nah, give me your ODB++, plus plus, I mean, give me your Gerbers and I'll figure it out. And don't even worry about an IPC net list or something else like this. Warning, warning, you're going to get crap out of it. So I really recommend ask for the 2581 database going forward and everything else is going to be actually embedded into it. Um, yeah. which just makes life easy. So Patrick, two more things to add to that. Uh, for those of you that have not uh, tried out IPC 2581, it is a single file format. So you don't have to gather all the files together like an IPC 2580 netlist, uh, you know, your bill of materials, uh, you know, the Gerber files, the NC uh, route file. It, it's all in one file. But the beauty of it is you can create separate uh, individual files for the separate downstream vendors, meaning uh, I can create one file just for the board shop. And that doesn't include certain information. Uh, I can uh, create a file for the test group. I can create another file for the assembly group. So the chances of your IP being plagiarized is very, is minimized and, and greatly reduced uh, by only giving those vendors the information they need. And that IPC 2581 provides for that. Yeah, it makes it. Yeah, it makes it so much simpler. If you guys watch the guys on the floor, they're sorting through all this data. They don't know what's there. You give them exactly what they need, and it gives a tremendous amount of control. And it's a single button push. Once it's set up into the scripting, it just rolls right out. Uh, that's that's great. Thanks, guys. No, that's perfect. And yeah, Cadence is a big supporter of twenty five eighty one, and and it's really pushing the industry forward. So yeah, thanks for that. Uh, and thanks, Hammond, for that as well. Okay, so, uh, you know, one thing, just one thing I want to point out on uh, on this, and of course, IPC 2581 also plays a role, but, you know, uh, fabrication drawings are super important. Uh, even if it's a standard design, you know, try not to default to whatever the fabricator is going to do. Try and specify, you know, things that are important to you. Uh, so uh, this is, a, uh, I would say, the bare minimum of what should go on your fab drawing. And the way that fabrication works is if you don't specify it, don't expect, don't expect anything, right? Like you, you wouldn't know what to expect. So uh, the more you can specify as to what is really critical to you, the better off, the better off you are. And so I would say this is kind of the bare minimum. Uh, to have on your fab drawing. And I think uh, Sierra, we offer like some standard fab drawings that you can import into your cadence, uh, 
cadence package if you're just getting started? If I can make a recommendation, one thing that we did um, when I was running my teams is we would have a text file that we would contain into this and we send that off to the fab shop and to the assembly shop and say, hey guys, read this over. Because everybody knows, you borrow fab notes from everybody. I actually see my fab, I used to see my, one. I had a misspelled word in one of my fab notes and I would see that come through the same misspelling from some other big company. And it's like, oh, they plagiarized my notes. That's okay, everybody does it. But sometimes you plagiarize, oh, that sounds kind of cool, but not knowing exactly what it is. When you get a great shop like Sierra, have them read it and ask the questions. And it's like, why do I need this? And they go, you don't need this. It's in the IPC, it's in your IPC standard. You're calling IPC class three on this thing. You don't need this note because it's actually counter counterintuitive to what you're saying here in your IPC class. Um, and it helps keep the notes as concise and simple as possible that getting everything in, just like Amit said. Um, but having everything, uh, via fill is another big one. It's like, well, hey, I want to do this via fill. And you put these big notes in there and they kind of go, well, that doesn't make sense because you can't do it like that. This is our process that we end up doing for it. Put a note like this. The idea is, is stop the thrashing. Everybody knows when you send something out, you're going to get a TQ coming back to you and they're going to go and they're going to highlight the note saying this note can't be done because it actually contradicts this or hey, or they just ignore it, which is even worse. I know Sierra doesn't do that. They'll come back and ask you and that's a day delay. Like we said in the very beginning, getting your process down and actually using the right formats really makes a big difference with this. Um, so send it out ahead of time and have them read it. And have multiple shops read it, and then you're going to get these really good set of notes, and somebody else is going to steal them from there, and the whole process actually gets better overall. Well said. Thank you. Okay. I think we really dived into 2581. I think we have, um, we, we're going to have another webinar on 2581, so I'm going to just kind of skip over this. Um, but there are definitely benefits and more benefits to come. So stack up, right? Stack up is um, even before you start your layout, do you have the right stack up for performance? Um, do you Have you picked the materials correctly? Um, not just for electrical performance, but also for manufacturability. Um, I just had a discussion with a customer who's, they're using uh, embedded uh, resistor materials and that embedded resistor material was not a core, not a, but uh, a foil on top of an inner sub, which makes the yield actually go down quite a bit. So something like that, um, you know, really has an impact on overall cost, uh, you know, going forward. So understand where your prepregs are and where your cores are and how the fabricator is going to build your product, I think is super key. Um, and we don't see this enough, but you know, for really sensitive or RF type product, you can specify the um, resin percentage, uh, which I think is a good idea. Um, if you don't, again, you don't know what you're going to get. You know, if the fabricator prioritizes quality, then you may get your material choices based on quality. If the fabricator prioritizes cost and you're not specifying what you want, then you may get materials that are basically lower cost. So super nope. important. Yeah, no better way to piss off your RF guy than putting an inferior material down there and they're wondering why their circuit doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> and and Amit, uh, one other thing to, yeah. to uh, emphasize is your first bullet there. Um, a lot of st uh, stack up um, tools out there uh, can can uh, export IPC 2581 stack ups. Yeah. Uh, our tool uh, can import the stack up via IPC 2581. And what that means is that there are no errors. Uh, I mean, as a designer, when I was designing, I would have to, uh, you know, input all that information by hand, which was prone uh, to errors. Um, so, uh, in, uh, in a, using the IPC 2581 stack up functionality with both our tools and the stack up tools eliminates any manual errors that can occur.
I, I can't I can't emphasize that more because you know what happens is, is as you're going through your design, you make you have get three or four different stack ups. You get changes, you add more layers or whatever else like this, and you're always editing it. And everybody knows as soon as you edit it once, your chance of making an error increases. Guess what? We're human. We screw things up. If you have this, you do a file import, you're done. It's just so simple. Is how do you make your life simple? How do you concentrate on the real problems, which is going to be the routing, the placement? How do you get your SIPI? How do you get your thermal considerations done on everything else? You should be worrying about making sure that the stack up's in there properly. It should just happen automatically. That's where this is highly encouraged. So please, from a 2581 point of view, you as the designers have all the power in this. Request it. Start asking them. Start asking your vendors. Sierra does an awesome job at this. Um, ask all your vendors this, and it should be perfect. But yeah, this is why we come to Sierra. Nice, thank you. Uh, and I think we have a demo now on our uh, stack of tool. I'll stop sharing. Vandana, take it away. Yes, thank you. So our PCB stack of designer tool provides manufacturable and cost optimized stack ups and also includes an impedance calculator. The tool also allows you to change the signal plane combination and the copper weights in the generated stack up. You can also download the stack up data in IPC standard 2581. We start by entering the board information, like the project name, a revision number, the PCB size. You can use the dropdown for the target PCB thickness and the PCB material as well. You can also use a material selector compare guide uh, to view the data sheets of various materials and compare their attributes. After filling in the board information, choose option one if you know the number of layers in your design or option two if you have a BGA that dictates the number of signal plane layers in your design. Uh, choose a layer count, a signal plane layer combination and click on run stack up designer. Uh, you will be presented with Sierra circuits recommended stack ups and click on this report button to view the final stack up that resembles your builder. So here on the report page, you don't have to go back to the previous page to view all the board attributes. If you do any changes to the board properties here, make sure to click generate custom stack up to update. Scroll down further and you will see a detailed construction of the stack up. Here you can change the layer type. Uh, for example, if I change the signal layer here to a plane or mixed layer, for example, the copper percentage is also automatically adjusted. Click on this cross symbol here to remove the solder mask. Scroll down further and you will find the uh, Sierra Circuit's built-in impedance calculator. This allows you to add control impedance and compute the trace width and trace spacing for the target impedance. Click on this plus sign here and this will add a fresh line here. Enter the details like the signal layer, target impedance, a model type, reference layer, and click on this calculate here. Uh, now save the stack up by clicking on this save button. Uh, Clicking on this button generates an ID that allows you to access the stack up in the next login sessions. If you click on export to IPC 2581, the stack up data is imported in a .xml file, which can be implemented to any ECAT tool which supports IPC 2581. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Vandana. I'm gonna share my screen now. And actually, if I can if I can talk about one more thing real quick, there was a comment in the chat here that I wanted to reference to, and that's actually doing copper balancing. Um, and that was with the stack ups and all the rest of that information. Um, I'm just going to slightly divert you. So with copper balancing, um, it really becomes on how do you want to do it. A lot of the fab shops, and I know Sierra does this, is they'll go ahead and give you a recommendation. If you see you have a note, and this goes back to our fab notes. It's like, hey, go ahead and you can add uh, copper balancing <clears throat> to the boards where we have voids out. Just stay this far away from um, signals and such like that. One of the things you want to make sure when you're doing that is also if you have an RF area or a sensitive area or a high speed area or something else is to go ahead and specify out in your fab notes is like, hey, don't do copper thieving inside this area. My preference for most designs was to actually have the fab shop do it. The fab shop knows their process. They know where their tolerances are. They're always testing this and they know what's really going on inside of that. So trust the fab shop, but actually put it into your notes and saying, hey, use thieving on the voided areas here to go ahead and make the copper balance work right. They're going to be, have the calculations. They have the tools to make it right. The only time that you would actually want to do it on yourself or do it yourself is if you're doing a controlled 
um, stack instead of a controlled impedance board where you're sending it off to a shop and saying, do exactly this, don't think about it. There are occasions to do that, but I really recommend on trusting a shop like Sierra to say, give me the, tell me what you need, let them balance it out, let them do it, because they're the ones that are responsible for having the warpage and everything else. They're going to be testing that as they come through to prevent the bow and twist. Um, they know what they're doing. This is why they're Sierra. So that'll be my recommendation. And does that sound about right, Amit? It does. Uh, I was going to actually mention that too. So perfect. No, it's, I think it's great. That's exactly right. And, uh, you know, one, one additional thing when you're, if you especially have like heavy copper, um, you want definitely a good amount of pour. So it helps us, uh, copper pour. So it helps us control the squeeze out of the prepreg. Um, and, you know, it just becomes even more important, uh, you know, in those regards. So, uh, so this this one slide's about traces. Uh, I think the key thing is, you know, when you're routing your traces, how close to the edge of the board uh, should you be? Um, you know, more is better. So I would say, you know, five to 10 mils. I think we can do uh, five depending on thickness of the board and, you know, 10 is very safe. Uh, and then if you're doing V scoring, you know, V scoring removes a lot of the material. Uh, so you need more spacing from the edge of the board. Um, there's also a capability of, um, you know, called jump scoring, uh, which is, uh, gives you a little bit tighter, uh, feature. So you don't have to be 15 mils away. Uh, so you can talk to your fabricator to see if they offer the jump scoring, uh, manufacturing but overall you know overall understand you know how the fabricator is going to build the product um, what foil are they going to start with and uh, how much copper are they going to plate up uh, you know that's important to know uh, so that uh, you're you're aware of the final end product like how much trapezoid are you going to have um, you know are you going to have uh, shortfall uh, from the etching you know all that is important. So Emmett, um, we, yeah. we didn't mention this at the start, but uh, time permitting, I'm going to give a demo at the end of our of our Design True DFM tool. And this was one of the checks you see here on the screen, the, the, the copper trace or uh, copper shape to board edge checks mm -hmm. that we have. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll talk about that more during my demo. Sure. And I think we're taking a lot of time on this, but I think it's good conversation. And if the webinar goes over a little bit, I would just continue, to be honest. And one other thing I'd like to add into there, be real quick on that, is, is please make sure also when you guys are doing that, you run your outer traces or inner traces up five mils or 10 mils within the edge. That's great. Sierra has that capability. Remember your reference planes, remember your ratios, and remember that the EMI that you have coming off of there, you got to have the, your fields have got to fall into a power plane or a ground plane, preferably to go ahead and keep your EMI solutions and actually your impedances correct. So even though you can go out to the edge, be careful about doing that. And, we, and one of the things is through our Design True DFM tools that we have, we can actually set different um, setbacks onto different layers, which is actually very important to do um, for those reasons. Yeah, absolutely. And so I wanted to just address heavy copper. I think it's uh, becoming more and more common, um, you know, with power uh, power designs that we're seeing. Um, so yes, as copper goes up, copper weights go up, your the etch is totally different. Uh, and also the solder mask is very different. Uh, so you want to talk to your manufacturer about the about the rules for your solder mask design. And for Sierra, we want to keep it one to one if it's, let's say, over three ounces of copper, um, so that you don't have solution entrapment and other uh, other issues with your solder mask process. Um, so, Emmett, so, um, uh, Patrick yeah. indicated that um, you know we can we can add uh, different rule sets for different layers. Uh, well, we can also, our DFM tool will also allow the designer to add different rules for different layers that have might have a different thick copper thickness. So if they have a, you know, a layer that's got a third ounce and another layer that might have one, another one that has 10, um, they can um, add different DFM rules 
for those layers based on the copper weights. So it's not a, a you know, one and done kind of thing. Okay, great. No, that's and, fantastic. And I'm going to add one more thing to this real quick. And so when you do a 30 ounce copper trace on there, obviously you're probably running a couple hundred amps at a high voltage. Every, all of us are doing the battery systems. We're doing chargers. We're doing whatever we're doing because of the EV world that's coming on. Um, one of the things that I would recommend is within the cadence tools we have is called the IDA and design analysis. A lot of the times as a designer, we use rule of thumb. It's like, Hey, we got those IPC charts. We look at it and I got five amps going across this distance and half ounce copper. We know, we know what to do there, but when you start getting up into 30 ounce copper and hundreds of amps and at high voltages, you really need a simulation tool to do that. And instead of relying on the SIPI guys to go ahead and tell you what to do, um, Cadence has these great InDesign analysis tools that actually do it inside the design canvas. So as you're doing it, you don't have to make assumptions. You don't have to over-design. You actually design it properly the first time and actually can do the analysis right there inside the inside the PCB tool. Um, Allegro X has some incredible capabilities of that. Uh, but just it's something I've been pretty passionate, especially when you get into big voltage, high voltage, high power um, applications. Okay, awesome. Yeah, thanks for thanks for mentioning that. Okay, you go to the next slide. Uh, so next topic is aspect ratio. Um, after you specify the the drill size in your in your data, the fabricator has to plate the hole. Uh, and then that sounds pretty straightforward, but uh, it, there's lots of complications that can come up. Um, and one of them is the aspect ratio. Um, are you setting up your fabricator for success um, to be able to plate without any, let's say, nodules in the via um, to meet the you know class requirements of how much copper is in the via and really giving you a reliable uh, via? So. I think that's the key takeaway from here is follow the aspect ratio rules of your fabricator um, so that you can, you know, set them up for success and get back the, the best uh, quality product. Now for laser drills, <clears throat> the way we do laser drill, um, we are definitely using the copper layer below um, to stop. And so that's the capture pad. So make sure you have a kind of a big enough capture pad so the laser doesn't blow through. Um, and then, you know, what's the shape of the microvia and is that platable properly? And, you know, even if the shape's not good, if you maintain a 0.75 to one um, in your design, then, then most fabricators should be able to plate that. One of the things about microvias and drill department um, that we also have is, depending on how you're using the microvia, people will actually use them for um, stitching for EMI concerns or something else like this, especially when you get to high speed and use um, stacked microvias or offsets. One of the things that we do through our tools is we have the ability to have different spacing rules for different micro for microvias on different layers. Um, when you're in the outer layer, you can make them a lot closer because you actually want to almost be like a trench almost to say, just have them really stacked up really close together. And I hate having all those DRCs that come through. Um, so that's actually one of the things that the, the power of the Allegro tool set is we were able to do that and with infinite flexibility because, hey, I want it for this, I want it for this net, I don't want it for this net, you can apply it directly. And the aspect ratios with our design true, these, the, all these rule checks come in live. So as you're pulling this together, you can see it's like, oh, I got my aspect ratio set wrong. Um, or I did something silly and you fat fingered something and you put the wrong number in. Um, the the Allegro will actually, Allegro X will actually tell you what's going on as you're doing it. You don't have to wait until you go to the manufacturer to get it checked. Okay, great. Uh, next topic is uh, drill the copper. So you know, if you have a single lamb, uh, drill the copper is straightforward. Um, if you have two subs, um, you know, it depends on how that material performs, um, how much does it move during manufacturing, uh, and that would be the um, drill the copper. Um, if uh, Steve Carney wants to, you know, one of our process engineering managers, if you want to talk about it, um, 
now's the time. You can, uh, Steve, you can talk about drilling, you can talk about annular ring and drill the copper and some of the challenges uh, faced during manufacturing, especially with uh, sublamps. Yeah, so part of the thing, um, so these are good guidelines for the for the drill the copper. Um, if you, we can get closer, um, but it takes some, uh, some upfront uh, material changes, uh, like a flat glass will handle a, a closer drill the copper than a standard weave. Um, but um, yeah, other than that, these are, you know, they're, they're fail safe um, guidelines. Yeah, I would say this is this is true. So if you have a laser drill versus a mechanical drill, is the drill the copper different, Steve? Um the uh the accuracy of the laser is is tighter. So because of the mechanical um all the things that are happening um in the mechanical dealing with some drill wander and a much bigger machine drill positional accuracy that sort of thing so you're um, in a mechanical drill um, like our drills um, the new small with the vision we're getting about a plus or minus two mil on positional accuracy where you put it on the laser and you're 10 times that you're like positional accuracy or plus or minus two tenths so um, you can definitely tighten things up with laser. Um, again, it's um, kind of a package thing that if you want to get into laser, um, you know, and, and, you know, high density, you know, tight areas with the laser, um, then you need to start looking at your, at your um, glass cloth. So, um, you know, a thin flat glass works much better than a standard glass. So, yeah, it's it's possible to tighten all these things up, um, but uh, you have to think about it up front and design for it. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks for commenting on that. I'm going to uh, comment gonna... real. I'll oh, go oh, ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead, Patrick. I was going to comment on the last one here. You have the drill to copper, and. Um, as a lot of you guys know, is we always do finish hole size. We've done that for years and years. But actually, drill the copper is the real thing that we need to be able to check here. Um, cadences, we're actually adding those DRC checks coming in in the next release, which will be in September. So we can actually put your use, say, hey, I'm doing this thing. I'm putting a 13 and a half mil drill down into here. This is really what the fab shop's looking for. The finished hole sizes are just kind of deriving from the finished hole size and working backwards to see what kind of drill they want. So we're going to work very close with Sierra on this to actually make sure that it becomes very easy for the designers using the Allegro tool set to call out the finished the the drill size because that's really where you can get um, accurate and you can buy that extra half mil by saying, hey, I want a 13 and a half mil drill here because this is what my my finished hole plating is going to be because I'm going to put about a I'm going to put one ounce of plating through this. This is going to be very, very powerful. And actually, as you know, for all your press fits and everything else, they're all very, very they always ask her, hey, do a finish, do a drill size of 26.5 and you plate it up by half ounce and there you go um, because they want a very accurate hole. This is the way we're going to be leaning towards. So just something to keep in mind. Emmett, if you're talking, you're on mute. Oops, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's an amateur, amateur mistake. Sorry. Um, so, so V and pad, right? So V and pad is important for assembly, uh, but it impacts your, you know, obviously how you build your product. Um, you know, the holes that get the V and pad should be properly called out on your your drill chart or your drill drawing. Uh, and the uh, aspect ratio should also be considered for the fill that needs to go into those vias. And then the fabricator that you have doing that should have a machine um, that properly um, induces a vacuum so that all the vias, the array of vias, let's say if you're underneath a BGA, that it get properly uh, completely filled.
Uh, so those are some of the key considerations um, for uh, VN pad. Yeah. yeah, be careful with your VN. I am okay. I'm not on mute. Be careful with your VM pad because when you have the assembly side of it, uh, assembly side of it, a lot of people do it and they don't. Pro pro wow! If I could talk, I'd be dangerous. They don't properly fill, or they have dimples, or they don't have a proper plate over process. Again, this is where you have your notes. Go to Sierra and go to your uh, uh, contract manufacturer. Make sure that this is done right. So when you do have a VM pad, they can assemble it. I can't count how many times we get through the x-ray machines and they got a VM pad sitting underneath a lead and they didn't they didn't plate it over properly and they just kind of let it sit there and it becomes a, 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 a sink for something or it sets the part up a little bit or something else like that. Yeah, that's great. And uh, so, and Sierra offers both, um, you know, like a silver fill as well as a non-conductive. And I want to just point out a misnomer. If you, you know, if you have VM pad, plated over, we are still going to plate the via with copper. So if you're just looking for having that, you know, just a normal plated via, you don't need to specify conductive fill. A non-conductive fill is, is totally fine. And Alexander, um, no, VM pad's been around forever. It's actually, I wouldn't avoid it. It's actually with these current designs going tighter and tighter. It adds a little bit of a process to it, but when you get in very tight designs, and actually from an SI and PI point of view, it's beautiful because you lose the LCR of a signal going off. VM pad for high frequency pad for high frequency bypass gaps is awesome because you actually make them more effective. So no, it's been around for and Vince is probably typing that exact same answer up right now. So there you go. Yes, and v, so VM pad. Um can pose some challenges if it's like a class three design, um, you know, how, how the stack ups put together, but more or less if it's a single lamb class two, uh, it's very straightforward. Yeah, it's very common. And actually you go below about 0.65 millimeter BGA on a large enough package, you've got to be the pad. Usually it's micro VM pad or something else like that. So it's common. Yeah. Patrick, yeah, you didn't, you didn't read my response, obviously. Uh, no, I actually it, it opened. It didn't ever flash back up there. Like I said, Vince and I are probably on the exact same page. I got to go read it now. <laughs> okay, great. And and, and Emmett, it goes to uh, it goes without saying that our tools will check for uh, VN pad uh, whether they're allowed to be fully in or partially in. Uh, we do check for that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, no, that's great. Um, so uh, via clearances, also a super important topic. Um, so at least it, it kind of goes back to, you know, like what are the design rules that you're using for your board uh, and, you know, setting up your, your tool properly. And, you know, the, at the very end, when we do our own DFM checks, we will definitely be flagging, um, you know, issues related to that. Uh, and so here are some of the common ones. Um, definitely uh, annular ring, um, drill a copper, uh, clearances of your solder mask, making sure that was appropriate is appropriate to your copper weights, as I was mentioning before. Um, you know, the anti pads, and you know, going back to the question that we did have. Um, if you set up your clearance uh, guidelines properly in terms of, you know, copper pores and making sure the spacing is correct, then there's really no issue with more copper. It's actually better um, for the lamination process and the squeeze out prediction and all of that. Just have your rules properly set so that, you know, your copper pores don't violate uh, manufacturing uh, guidelines. A little deeper dive into uh, annular rings. Uh, specify your annular rings per design wise per class two or per class three. Um, we have a great blog article that talks about that in super detail. Uh, and you want to make sure that uh, the annular ring for uh, a dr mechanical drill is obviously can be different than an annular ring for uh, a laser drill. And so here in the, what's depicted is, you know, breakouts allowed. 
uh, for class two or tangency is allowed for class two and for class three that is definitely not allowed. Um, so that's why you have to design differently per class two or per class three. Here's uh, Steve um, working on a laser machine. Is this supposed to be a video? Yeah. I think we're good on that. But uh, what you saw there was that the laser machine looks for targets to align. And one, uh, you know, if your fabricator is used to building sequential lam or subs, you know, they really have spent a lot of time understanding how the machines talk to each other and setting up proper targets. Um, that's a super key part um, for these types of complex designs. And so what you saw there was the laser machine aligning to uh, targets. Uh, so the next topic is, you know, really around, uh, you know, just again, how you are verifying your design, uh, what kind of DRCs you set up. And then when it comes over to Sierra, we will use your netlist to make sure at least that the connections that should be there are there and the connections that should not be there um, shouldn't be there like uh, a direct connect to ground, um, you know, that they shouldn't be there. We'll, we'll find that all before we start manufacturing uh, the board. One of the things you, I want to bring up real yeah. fast here, and I know we're running low on time, but um, the IPC, when you do 2581, you don't have to do the IPC or anything else like that. Actually, part of the process of that, it is actually embeds an independent um, a logical net list and the physical net list. So the comparison works out really well. It's one more step you don't have to do. Um, IPCs are notorious because, I mean, the only reason everybody's so good at it is they've been around for bloody 45 years. So everybody's gotten good at all the shortcomings of them. When you have 2581, we don't have those shortcomings and the logic is actually very, very powerful inside of it. So it works a lot better and it catches these kind of things. By the way, a lot of this stuff that you're seeing up here, this is, looks like a Genesis tool, um, is or would also be caught inside the Allegro tool um, through our design true and actually through our standard DRC checks too. So the idea is, is how do you actually lean this forward? And one of the questions we had earlier is, is what design practices do you want to, what design tools for checking do you want to do? You you want to actually have it checked inside your board file before you're actually going out to fab. You don't want to having a sec, you want somebody to verify, yes, the fab shop's going to verify, but get it right the first time rather than going back and making changes. But we'll talk more about that in a moment. Yes, and and there was a, there was a question to laser drill, which I missed, um, asking if you can have like a, a landless, via laser drill via or basically no pad and you can do that but it doesn't meet class two or class three guidelines so solder mask solder mask is very important um both as it, it there's a lot of defects in pcb manufacturing as it relates to solder mask if the solder mask is not designed well um and also it's obviously critical for assembly uh, getting that right. So number one rule, make sure you have enough solder mask web. Uh, four mils is what every fabricator should be able to do. Uh, if you need to get lower than that, uh, you know, we can, but you need to talk to us about it. Uh, and the other key part of solder mask that, you know, there are different colors, but if you have a tight design, uh, green has the most robust um, processing. Um, and again, not just for us, but for all fabricators. So okay. if it's a, go ahead. I, I got a, I got a question for, this is the standard question because black solder mask looks cool with red silk. Um, <laughs> what is your opinion? Is black really hard to work with? I'm going to ask what somebody else is going to ask in a moment. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, it is. <laughs> 
Can you tell uh, us why? So everybody knows. Yeah. Um, this is Steve Carney. Um, so the green is most prevalent. Um, there's a bunch of um, there's a bunch of stuff in solder mask, all the fillers and pigments and all of that. So what happens is um, the green is is the easiest to process, primarily because of the um, the way it exposes and polymerizes. So black is difficult. Um, uh, what happens with solder max real quick is it, it's pretty thick and when you start to expose it um essentially the top skins over so you have to drive more light down through it so the more power it requires and black requires a lot of power um then the uh, the more power you have to dump into it and then you start getting issues with you don't put enough power in it then you don't get it get it exposed and polymerized all the way through um, and then you just have to hit it with more power so things start to go sideways and that's why it's more difficult to work with it looks cool but my gosh is it a pain when you get it and you're and it's harder to control especially when you have fine pitch going yeah uh, yeah if you can stay away from black great there are a few companies out there that have mastered this through their contract manufacturing process, but they put a billion dollars into figuring out the process. Most of us don't have that kind of resources. It's um, it's gotten better. So we do all our um, all our mask exposure on uh, on laser direct imaging. So mm -hmm. they've actually um, added wavelengths to the systems, the new systems, so you can essentially start exposing from the top down and the bottom up, which helps quite a bit with black, but it's still um, it's still kind of nasty stuff. Um, so anyway, that's uh, that's kind of the scoop on black solder mask. It's just hard to it's hard to expose. And since okay. I like you guys so much, I'm gonna tell you one little one little thing that's happening is is we're actually gonna have a a positive solder mask capability in twenty four. So up in September here, we're working on that now, changing everything up just a little bit. Might be easier nice. for some people to visualize. Yeah, exactly. And mm -hmm. and to add further, and to add further that uh, it doesn't look like I'll get a chance to do my uh, demos. But if anybody's interested in knowing more about the Design True DFM tool within uh, our our products, it's a real time design tool, which means the the errors will be eliminated while you design. So you're not going to get any surprises back from your fab house. Uh, and we have all kinds of solder mass checks for the webbing, uh, for um, traces that might be exposed. You know, a, a little section might be exposed because of a pad uh, opening from another component, et cetera, et cetera. We have all kinds of solder mass checks in the in the tool. Uh, I do want to. Just Vince, mention, Vince, can I yep. can I interrupt? I think you should do your demo. That's what I was gonna say. Because oh, okay, if you have time, I can do it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna, actually this was the last slide. Um, okay. Silk screen, but you can cover that. Okay. All right. So, all right. I didn't think I was gonna have time, but uh, no, no, yeah, let me share. share. Let me share my screen and uh, real quick. Uh, doo -doo, come on. Share. You can see my my screen. Yes, we can. Okay, so I, I'm not going to go into the details of of setting it up. Um, there are three categories within the Design True DFM tool. There's DFF, which is fabrication. There's DFA, which is assembly, and there's DFT, which is test. Um, everything is done through our constraint manager. If I pull that up. We'll see here manufacturing. We have DFF, DFA, and DFT. Um, you you set up rule sets. So I have a um, a DFF uh, a C set called Vince here with a with a setting. I've I've already set these up for you ahead of time. Um, we also have the native checks that you might be familiar with: electrical, physical, spacing, and same net. Um, those are still there. Those are batch, whereas the Design True DFM are real time. Depending on the license that you may have, um, you may have access to what we call our core checks. Uh, there's roughly about 300 of those. And if you have a different license, you might uh, have the extended checks, which are about uh, give or take, don't count me on the numbers, but about around 2000. 
And the difference being is on the core checks, we will have a simple hole to hole check. So you can specify any hole to any hole, whether it's a via or a through hole, it's just a hole to hole check. But in the extended, we break that out granularly to differentiate between the different vias, whether it's a through via or a micro via or you know, those kinds of things. And uh, so you can you can get more granularity with the extended uh, checks. So I've already gone in, created the rule sets. I've added values to the rule sets. I'm not going to show you that. And I've assigned the rule sets in the design itself um, at the at the different levels. You can see here for outline, I've I've assigned um, a, a rule set to all and to top. Um, like we referenced before, you can assign different rule sets to different layers um, depending on your application mode. And then once you've assigned, everything is um, done through, and I'll show you a couple of different ways, through the, through the modes um, in our system. Um, this replicates what you saw in Constraint Manager, but you have to turn the rule on or off. Okay, so if we... Um, if we go to um, display status, we can see that this design has zero errors. Okay, that's the way the design is right now. I can update it and there's zero errors. But I'm going to go to set up, um, where are we here? Uh, don't rush Vince. Um, if I go to uh, outline, okay, so that's our board outline, outline to component to outline, where are we here? My apologies, I'm rushing here. Outline to, uh, it'd be helpful if I went to the right went one. Went to assembly, yeah, I was gonna yeah, say. I went to assembly, <laughs> ah, okay. Yeah, it's like I, time, I, I have you to read time. my script. So if we go back into the status, we'll see now we've got five, five DRCs, all right? and. Um, and if I look at the DRCs, there's already components that exceed the board edge. Okay, so um, there's uh, five of them in total. There's four over here and, and the other connector on the other side. Now, what you can do is you can also look at our DRCs through our DRC browser, and you can, you know, basically uh, take a look at this. And you, if you click on here, it'll take you to the error on the on the system. But I can also wave the DRCs here and add a comment as to why I wave the DRC. Um, so if you've never used our DRC browser, I would highly recommend you you use our our DRC browser. Um, again, these ones are required, okay? But to show you what I mean by real time, if I was to move a component, and I'm gonna move a symbol, okay? If I was to move a component and put it there, right away I get a new error and I can look at the error and see that uh, the rule of outline uh, to component um, is breached and it's supposed to be 0.635 and it's overlapping, meaning I've gone over the board. Okay, you can't see part of this component, but this is what I mean by real time. The error occurred as soon as I dropped that component, okay? And the moment I, I put the component back, the rule goes away. That's a, a simple um, component to uh, board um, outline edge. If we go to back to the rules, and I go to DFF this time, and I go to outline, outline to trace, and I turn, and oh, by the way, we, we tell you uh, blurbs, if you hover over this information button, uh, you can see that uh, the, the right-hand side talks about the rules and gives you a, a picture of what that rule is. So I've turned on uh, outline to trace. Okay, I'll apply that, and, and this will trigger the DRCs. And if we go look at the status, uh, we're still at five, okay? Um, but, uh, so there's no no errors uh, created, but if I just simply reroute this, okay? And I gonna just route, okay? Uh, you can see I, I uh, it, it moved it back on purpose because what you don't see here is there's a route keep out shape uh, that I turned off for clarity. But again, if we go and look um, at the DRC, 
we've got a min outline to trace spacing. And again, it was 0.635 is the constraint and I'm at 0.5 because that's uh, the distance from the board edge to the route keep bin. Uh, I could make uh, my route keep bin the same value so that I don't get these errors and I can't go close. Um, but uh, that's an example of, of I'm routing and I, I see the DRCs right away. Okay, so that was um, that. If I go back and quickly show you uh, constraints modes and outline to shape. Okay, same sort of thing, but it's going to be to a copper shape. And if I turn it on and show you, now we've got additional errors. And, and if you didn't know, you can click on this little yellow box and you get the DRC errors. And with these DRC errors, we tell you what the errors are. And you can see here, min outline to shape spacing. I click on it and what you didn't see in the back was that um, the uh, it zoomed right to the error. Um, and again, what I can do is I can create, let me just get rid of this real quick. I can add a shape and I wanna add it to the top side and I wanna add it to net zero. And if I add a shape, all right, again, um, it cuts it back to where my route keep out is. But again, it's given me a real time error that um, the outline to shape spacing is is being violated. So again, I want to emphasize it again. It's it's real time. Um, one of the bigger ones we talked that Amit talked about was annular rings. So if we go back to uh, the constraints modes and turn on under uh, annular ring and we go pins through pins and you can see the granularity that you can set up. And one of the things that I'll mention, uh, I should have mentioned at the beginning is do not get uh, overwhelmed and get full of anxiety of the number of rules that we have. What we recommend is that you talk to your board shop or you, you talk to a manufacturing group and figure out uh, what are the top three or five errors that your designers keep making? And so whichever ones those are, implement those first, wait a couple months and then talk to your, your, your manufacturing group again and see if they are still having those errors. When you eliminate those three or five, then go move on to the next ones, okay? So, um, so we're gonna turn on the whole to pad um, check. And if we do apply, we do okay, and I believe there's no errors on this design. And again, there's a seven, which are the original five plus two shapes, okay? But now what I'm gonna do real quick is I'm going to go in and I'm gonna change a path stack. And a lot of designers will do this. So I go in and I get the, the path stack for one of these connectors and I'm going to change it and all I'm gonna do is change the uh, pad stack on the top layer from 2.3 to 1.75, uh, correct, yeah. And I'm gonna say file, update to design and exit. And immediately, if we look, um, we have an additional uh, 12 errors. And if I look at the error now, again, if I go back and I look at the errors, it's an annular ring through hole to pad error. I had specified in my rules uh, 0.05 millimeter, which is roughly two mils, a two mil annular ring, and I'm down to a one mil annular ring with that pad stack change. So the moment I made the pad stack change, I got notified of DRCs right then and there. So, you know, if I was a good designer, I would try and figure out what did I just do to cause these errors. Um, the other ones that uh, Amit talked about were uh, silkscreen related changes. And again, I'm going all over the map here, uh, but I just wanted to give you, uh, you know, some flavor of all the different checks we, we have. So if we go to DFF, silkscreen and text under, oh, what happened there? Come of on. course, it's a demo. Something's got to go wrong. Yeah, uh, silkscreen <laughs> and we look under text under component. Okay, so I apply and I go okay. And now if I was moving text, um, let's say I you know, try to move J2 underneath this component. 
I just went in a bit and I got an error right away. And this could be for any component. You can see the error appears right away. I'm not gonna show you the error, but you know that that's what the error is. Um, we can check for uh, setup, constraints, modes, and we can go back and do uh, text overlap. And I'll turn on uh, silk screen over vias. So vias uh, through bad via. Okay, I'm gonna turn on, I'm gonna just jump ahead here a little bit and say apply. Okay, so uh, the two I turned on were um, overlap. So if I overlap this one with this one, I'm getting an error. And I also got one for the pad. Okay, because I moved it a little too close. But there you go. There's one over there. And if I try to put this anywhere on top of the silk screen of the via, that's the, the light blue is the solder resist opening. Uh, again, I, I get uh, an error. So there's, you know, some silk, quick silk screen um, issues. Uh, we talked about solder mask slivers. So if we go back out and we look at constraints modes and we go to mask and we go to do, 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 DFF, uh, DFF mask, mask slivers. Okay, we call them slivers, but in, in the industry, the, you know, the webs between, uh, we can say, okay. Um, and again, if I look display status, uh, there's a whole bunch of errors here. Okay, so we can again, look at some of these errors, uh, mass spacing. So let's see what this one brings up. Um, I can turn off, all off and bring up the top solder mask in there. So here we're getting some, some slivers here, meaning uh, some um, small webs right here. Um, this is one of the checks because it's checking the corner of this one to the the tangent of this uh, circle. So that is going to be a problem for manufacturing. If this up in here violated, you would get a, uh, depending on the setting, obviously the value, you would get a DRC here as well. Um, I'm not going to show you the solder mask opening to copper, um, but in cases where, let's see, uh, let see if I can show you an example without turning the rule on. But if, yeah, like if this trace, you know, if we do, 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 where do we go here? Slide. If I was to, you know, do this sort of thing, and right here, it opened up a little bit. I didn't turn the rule on, but if I did, you would get an error here because I've exposed the copper trace with this solder mask opening. That's another check. The ones I wanted to show you were um, uh, min spoke count, thermals. We talked about uh, thermals there. So if I can go to constraints modes and go to DFF copper features, Thermal positive, so we support uh, positive planes and negative planes, but this design has positive. And I turn on min spoke count. Okay, again, this is checking and I say, okay. And I go visibility last and then off and show you the bottom. Okay, um, you can see here that um, this component only has one thermal coming off of it uh, but my rule my rule set for two so if we look at the drc here uh i have a rule constraint value of, of minimum of two spokes but this design has one and in your case this is probably valid because it's a discrete component so you can waive this rule um so that's another one and then the last one which uh let me just turn the visibility off was set up constraints modes and if we go to copper features and we talked about antennas uh we talk about traces okay we check for antenna traces and antenna vias so vias you would spend a certain amount of stub uh, but in traces again uh, we hit the apply and if we go and look at uh, the rules, let's go back to DRC browser real quick. Um, design for fabrication, uh, copper features, antenna. See how you, you can granularly check all this. Um, there is a antenna on inner one layer. So I'm going to um, uh, click on it. It'll take me there. And then if I do an off and I turn on inner one, I see 
that um, uh, that this uh, trace has as an antenna because it's sitting with uh, no connection at the other end. So that is a real quick, uh, like 15 minute demo. I apologize for rushing, but like I said, if um, if you know you have an interest, uh, I'm guessing if you you know work for any enterprise customers, you already may have uh, Design True DFM in your tools, and maybe you've never turned them on. If you're interested, again, like I said, start small um, and only add a few rules. Uh, but if you if you want more of a, a demonstration or you want to talk to me, um, it's uh, you know feel free to reach out uh, and and I'll be more than happy to show you the tool and answer any of your questions. Okay, I got a, got a you. quick question for you, Vince. Um, sure. We had one of the things is our analysis mode setting saved in Allegro or do you have to set it for each design? Uh, you're talking about AI uh, analysis modes or uh, analysis, analysis modes, modes uh, the or analysis these, mo these, these, the, the modes, these modes, the mo yeah, yeah, modes that I turned on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they're, they're, they left uh, everywhere. Every time you touch one of those and you save the design and you get out and you come back in, they're the same settings. You don't have to reset them every time. No. Perfect. And uh, the acid traps. Yes. That's not an old wife's tale. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, one other thing I'd like to say on this as a closing comment, it, um, a lot of people know the Valor. If you guys are the old school like me and been doing this, like Vince and I have been doing this way too long, we got the gray hair to prove it. Valor was the standard. Basically, what this does is this does everything that Valor does. Um, and for the most part, the other rule numbers, the exact same, no. But Valor also had a lot of cornerstones that were put into there that no one ever uses anymore. We cover what, Vince, 85% of what Valor yeah, does? Yeah, roughly like that. 85%. We're not, gonna, we're not going to add a, a, you know, a, a single rule that Valor may have put in for a specific customer, yeah. like, like you said, is not being used anymore. So we, we cover 85% of what Valor does. Yeah, and but basically we cover what is needed. And this is the feedback. And as Vince said very early on, is we have some very, very you know, cadences in all the biggest companies companies around. And so we have some very large companies that have actually used to have 50 seats of Valor and they're down to one. And what they do is they use the design true. And as Vince said, which is exactly true, it's a slow process. You build it in. Hey, what's my biggest DRC is great. Let's add them in there. What's the next DRC is let's add them in there. And you build it up to your design until you actually get a real rule set. If you go a uh, whole hog onto this thing and start to start off, I'm going to put every rule in here possible, man, you're going to go nuts. But start off simple, start off small, make it easy, and, and it works extremely well. It gives you a very clean design. And eventually what happens is, is the fab shops don't have any TQs that come back to you. You get your notes taken care of first. You make sure your bomb is clean. And then you end up having the uh, design true in there. And guess what? It's one shot, one shot done. You don't have the TQs coming back at 930 at night on a Friday night. And they say, hey, we got a delay in three days because uh, we have a question on this. It avoids Patrick, all those the problems. other the other thing that I would suggest to to everybody in the in the crowd is please do not take a, an existing design which you've already finished and you know you know went through the fab correctly and then all of a sudden turn on design true DFM because it'll scare you, you. You, you. Yeah, you're gonna get you might get errors because of the of the rule sets that are the way they're set. I mean, you you have to research and and do it properly, and uh, and then uh, uh, trust me, you won't regret it when you turn it on. It's, it saves days and possibly weeks on your design process. Who wouldn't want to do that? Yeah. Not to say a lot of gray hair. All right. I think that's everything. And uh, so I think we got the analysis mode answered. And and uh, thank you, Gino. Yes, we actually do that auto, the auto silk screen conjunction. Yep, it's really powerful. Yeah. All right, Amit, back to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks to the attendees. Uh, so I thought that was a great discussion and uh, more to come, I think. Right. We love um, it. Okay, great. Thanks, guys, so much. Thank thanks. you, everybody. Hey, thank you.